Okay, can, uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? How about now? Can you hear me or is it like, it has some noise, isn't it? A little bit. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Well, I'll keep it like that. Something happened to it, it's not in good health. Okay, let's try with that. Um, you may have seen that I have started sending to some of you your individual performance as we discuss. I have not done it for the whole class yet because it takes some time to develop that for each one of you. So I can do up to 40 a day practically. So I, I hope that by tomorrow I will finish all of you. And um, I try to put my notes there. I have uh, gone through your surveys and I'm trying to see, uh, now we have a number of surveys of whether there has been for some of you who uh, submit specific comments, in fact, I have to thank you for doing that. I would like to see whether over time those comments are addressed. In some other cases, the comments, at least some issues with teamwork, have been there. And um, I would like to make sure that I do the best I can to address your concerns in this class. I know that you cannot see very well on the board, we have limited, this class is, um, is not, was not designed for either a big crowd or for very narrow, obviously, and then people are having to sit very far in the back. And the electronics are not that great, but I will try to do the best I can. So I will keep, I will have both uh, information on the screens and then I will also derive things on the board. And I found a number of colored chalks and other things so we can see how um, some things do not get too many lines and things get too complicated. So we'll see how it goes from here. Um, if you, as you receive my comments in relation to your uh, individual performance, if you have any questions, please let me know. In fact, um, I would love to meet with uh, as many of you who have issues of one way or another and then see whether I can do the best I can or what can I do to improve your, to address your concerns. So we'll try to do that. Uh, the office hours today, unfortunately, the room was taken for something else and uh, the office hours will be tomorrow after the uh, problem solving session and it is in my office, which is not, uh, this one that I'm using is not in academic search, but it is, you know where the Grove is. Some of you have taken courses there. I will put on the website a little map because it's easy to come from Kemper, but you need to know how to come there. So I will, uh, I will um, send it to you via an announcement later today or this evening you if you want to come for office hours there all right any uh, any comments questions concerns so far oh, one more thing I have created a folder or a module that is called examples for midterm and I have I know that it's not just for the midterm obviously uh, but a number of you have expressed concern which is a valid concern that this book does not have any problems and so forth I um, searched the web over the weekend and I found a number of solutions which I believe will be good if you have time and interest to look at them. These are uh, very similar problems to what we solved in the class. I don't want you to believe that you have to read these 88 examples pri primarily. 
I gave you enough of them to cover in the, on these two topics, which is electrostatics, magnetostatics, to cover your needs for the quarter or you know later if you want to do that. But um, they are good salt examples, and you know you can look at those. Or if you have any questions about this, be very careful on how to look at examples critically, because not not very often, but once in a while there are mistakes made. And so read the problems. Don't try to read it like text. You know, you go through a problem and look at the solution. Try to solve it before you look at the solution. And then visit the solution only when you don't know how to solve the problem. Or check the solution after you're done with the problem and you want to check how you've done it. Just by reading it, uh, unfortunately, in this particular area, it's not going to do very much. Because somehow you think that you know all of the material makes sense to you. When you try to reproduce it yourself, it does not happen. So that is the advice on how to read these problems. But there are plenty of them for those of you who want to practice. Any questions so far before I start with today's lecture? W uh, can we? Pardon me? Oh, is it locked? OK. Yes, sometimes I do that. Let me just. Take care of this right now. This week's module is locked, like today's. OK. Yeah. OK, that should be fine. All right, so uh, outline. So summary again, I would like to keep summarizing the most important points from what we've seen in the past and draw the, the, the connections or the dualities or the similarities, whatever those are, because this way you will be able to connect everything that we learn to things that we have seen before. And that kind of connection is extremely important. Try to do this yourselves when you study Try to think that everything that we have learned, how does this connect to the previous, and how will this help us forward? So it's a story, all right, as I said. It's not like isolated components that eventually will not go anywhere. They may see, uh, they may look different, or they may look disconnected, as at least we start and we go through each one of them. But each one of them has a purpose. And there are a lot of similarities. Uh, among those. So then, uh, after we cover the summary, I will talk about inductance. And then we'll have, at the end, forces and torque just as an introduction to the next chapter. Because in the next chapter, we'll see time varying fields. Not necessarily Maxwell's equations, but we will see fields that either vary over time or the flux varies over time because there is some uh, motion, like there's movement that takes place. So the problem changes over time because there's a mechanical movement. In some other cases, the problem changes or the excitation changes over time because it is a function of time. And we would like to see those. Yes. No, no, I mean, I don't. Um, the only thing that I would like you to remember is the in form for the inductance, and we will calculate the number of problems today. Yes. OK. <laughs> OK, um, all right. Let me do that at the end before we go. I will. Um, Sometimes, you know, I don't know. It's, I, there are so many things in Canvas, and I'm trying to do those myself, and I make mistakes, obviously. But I will give you enough time to do those. Uh, don't worry. I will just think I'd have to fix it before I leave. OK, so um, let's go to the summary. And uh, again, trying to remember what we are trying, what we have covered in this class, and 
how everything else relates to what we've learned previously or how it builds up in the knowledge that we have so far acquired. So, electrostatics. We said at the end of the day, of course electrostatics is extremely important. There are a, a, there are a number of applications in real life that really come out of electrostatics. We have not been able to cover all of these applications for sure in this class. It's just an introduction to electromagnetics. So don't believe that we will have enough time to cover everything that electrostatics could lead us to in terms of applications. But for us, in terms of applications specifically for this class, what we are gonna find useful from electrostatics will be C capacitance and R resistance. And why is that? Because a lot of times complex problems, we try to reduce them to something simpler. And a circuit representation is a reduction method to solve a complex problem in a lot easier way, all right? So we are then going from the three-dimensional problems where geometry is extremely important to circuit quantities, entities, like capacitance and resistance, which are truly um, electrical entities. All right, geometry has already been incorporated when we calculated those. And therefore, when we go from a fairly complex three-dimensional problem to a circuit representation, we reduce the complexity. We have already incorporated the importance of the geometry. And then we use these two values in place of a capacitor of a three-dimensional parallel plate, for example, capacitor with all kinds of materials in there. Or um, we have eliminated and incorporated in R the uh, complex geometry of a conducting material that introduces a resistance frame early. Right? And we found that in these two, there is geometry that enters in addition to epsilon, nu naught, in this case, and sigma. All right, these are important electrical parameters. Then, to um, compare in, let's see whether you will see that. I got a color chart. So magnetostatic, do you see this, this color or not? Okay. to Target this morning to buy those, and there was a family with little kids. <laughs> they were buying the same thing. And they said, oh, yeah, we have to keep our little kids busy at home. I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> I was doing exactly the same. I said, yeah, yeah. I did not explain why I needed those. So magnetostatics, we have L. All right, that is the important parameter that we are going to introduce today. And in here, we have, again, again, geometry incorporated and the mag uh, uh, magnetic parameters, epsilon naught, and sometimes it can be more than, uh, higher than epsilon naught. So we can have an epsilon, but also mu that makes it a magnetic. Okay, another thing that we have seen between these two are the forces, and these are important as we move forward. And what kind of forces have we seen? We have seen the electric force, which is primarily QE, and we have seen the magnetic force, which is QB cross B. 
all right? So a static charge, electric force, a charge that moves magnetic inside a B field feels a magnetic force. If you have a static charge inside a B field, it's not gonna feel anything. If you have, um, however, a, a charge that is moving inside an electric and a magnetic field. So you can superimpose an electrostatic and magnetostatic. You can superimpose them. Their sources will be independent for now, all right? But you may have a source that produces an electrostatic field and another source that produces a magnetostatic field. And if you have a charge Q in the combination of the two fields, and the total force F on this charge will be Q E plus V cross B. All right, so we are building. Now, eventually we are gonna use that even when we go to fields which are connected. So in Maxwell's equations, you have a one source that produces both, all right? So far, electrostatic and magnetostatic fields are not codependent. So we have independent sources to produce them. All right, what else have we learned? Important equations. For electrostatics, and these e equations are very important because we use them all the time. We have that the divergence of D equals Q. And then this particular Q, now you can tell, it's like equivalent to either we call it a point charge or it is a charge volume density. Okay, so it's either one charge at one point in space and that's it, or if it is a distributed charge, then it's a charge density, okay? What else do we have? That the electric field equals D divided by epsilon. Then we also have that the field that is due to a, uh, infinitesimal charge, um, so a charge that exists at one point, can be very small, for example, is going to be dq, and that dq can be a point charge as well, but now for consistency, I represent uh, the impact in the form of a field of an infinitesimal charge. That could be a charge density. And then, four pi epsilon, or epsilon naught, if we are in free space. Also, you can do that. R over R cubed. Okay, the other thing that we know is that E equals minus gradient of V, and that's how we introduce the potential. That tells us that the curl of V is zero. I write that because it's going to be nice to see a dual uh, relation in magnetostatics. And then using all of these and the geometry of the problem, what do we find? We find C, which is Q over V, where now Q is the total charge, all right, in this geometry, that R is V over I, where I, it's the conduction current, and the conduction current density is sigma E. Okay, so this now, you see, we go from three-dimensional to circuit representation in magnetostatics. Now we have similar things. First of all, the divergence of B. What is it? Do you remember? Zero. Why is that? Because B goes on circular paths. 
All right, it does not have a, a beginning and the end. It does not have a beginning at the end. It goes on a circular path that connects. And as a result, this is zero. What else do we have? H is B divided by mu. Then the magnetic flux density from a infinitesimally small current is also dB. And this is from Biot-Savart. This is equal bi, which is the infinitesimally small current, cross r, r cubed. OK? Look at this one and then this one. There is correlation between the two, with the exception of the cross product. What else? We know Ampere's law. This is Gauss's law. This is Ampere's law that says the curl of H equals J, which is the generating current, the current that generates the magnetic field. This is the intensity, and this is the flux density. And now, Using all of these, we define L as the total flux through a surface S we will, as you will see in the examples, we select appropriately, divided by the total current I that generates the magnetic field, where the total flux, as I said, is the surface integral of B dot DS. Okay? This is the duality. And the everything that we've learned so far is in this, here on this board. And we've done all of these, at least for this class. So we can find this one, <coughs> and we can find these two. That's why we went to all of this trouble. Yes. There is, but I don't want to consider it because it's only it's a mag it's a it's a magnetic potential. But physically, that we see it in circuits. The other ones we don't. We see the current. So we are going to use only entities that we see, also that we measure. But you can always define a lot of different, theoretically speaking, you can, define, you can define different quantities so you practically have complete duality. But I don't want to use it here. It's not useful for us now. Any questions at this point? Because now we are moving forward to solve problems. First now, in this one, I would like to also draw your attention to now some uh, similarities or differences that we see on same structures, geometrically speaking, when we have generating sources like charges or currents. So. I have a parallel plate capacitor. Um, before I start talking about this problem, is, is it okay if I erase that? Any questions? Okay. I take that silence as no.
right? So one problem here is that they does not erase very well. <laughs> now we know. But I brought some, let me see. First one, when we have a parallel plate capacitor or a structure, a three-dimensional structure that has two perfect conducting plates, and then it's connected to a source, right? So you have all of the plus, charges here, negatives here. And then so your electric field is going to go like that. And when we solve this problem, if this is the x, y, and this is z, when we solve this problem, we found that E here is constant. And it's equal to The charge density here, which, so if this has an area, A, the charge density is Q divided by A, all right, assuming that it's uniformly distributed and assuming that we don't have any problems, any issues from the uh, fringe fields here, from the edges. And then divided by epsilon naught. Very interesting, obviously, because the distance between the two conductors does not play any role. The distance of the two conductors plays a role where? In the calculation of V, all right? So we found E here. Let's now take the same structure. And instead of charges, we have a current that flows out of the bore, all right, towards the z positive direction. And it looks like this here. And all of these little circles just um, show the surface current density. And the current flows, like with the charges, on the lower phase of the parallel of the conductor and then here we have a return current all right and somehow if we put place them with a the source this is gonna go it's gonna feed the current here somehow the current has to come and connect at the end and go back it has to have a, a, a continuous path one that is not terminated anywhere Okay, um, do you remember when we solved this problem? When, how do we solve normally problems like that? I will remind you how we started the solution, but I'm not gonna go through the derivation again. The only thing here is that we know is that curl of H, so if this is a total current I that comes out of the board, and this is J sub S, which is a uh, current distribution, then this one is related to J sub S. That we know from Ampere's law. And then the other thing we know is that if we take this, if we take a small surface here, like this, all right, and we call that surface S. All right, S is going to have a vector that comes out of the board. So S will be N, S 
where n is going to be the positive a sub z n. And then from here, we know that if we integrate this according to Stokes' theorem, we are going to have the line integral on this closed path C of h dot dl is going to be js in this case times whatever is the size of this one. Let's assume that we call that delta w because it's small. All right, so, and where, what is this C? This C is nothing else, but if that comes out, it's this path. And goes on this closed path. And you can see the closed path in is in the metal where there is, away from the surface, there is a zero field. So practically, that at the end will give you that H, if we assume that we have, this is L, and if we assume that we have a total number of these N currents, which also you can consider that each one of them is a loop, all right? So one, two, th let's assume that all of them are loops, because we will go eventually to see loops. If we, if each one of those was one loop, starting here and closing to there, and then we have n total of, of those, then we found that h was n i divided by l, where i in this case, all right, is exactly the current that flows um, in each one of these loops, okay? So what we do in reality is instead of considering an, an discrete n number of loops, we treat the problem as we if we were a current i equal to n a total current i equal to n i, all right, so total, n i, okay, as if this total was distributed evenly on the surface. That's why we do it. Okay, so remember, we treated this problem as if we had a uniform current total flowing out of the board like this, but equal to n, which is the number of coils times the current that flows in each one of them. And then, of course, in this case, your surface current density will be the total n i divided by L. Okay? So that's all we found, very simple. Which means that H does not does not depend on um, the distance between the two plates. And it goes like that. So if this comes, yeah, we go like this. Okay, so look at the two, very similar, but have different directions, obviously, and different formulas. Now, interestingly enough, epsilon is part of this, nu is not part of this. So where does nu come into the picture? When we go to calculate b, so b. When we calculate b, b then becomes nu, depends on the material you have in here. It could be free space, it could be also some magnetic, N I over L. In fact, sorry, this is not the way I had it. It should be along, in this particular case, A sub X, and A sub X. Okay. 
her gate. Now, if you go to coaxial conductors, you will see a very similar thing there. All right, look at the two pictures. Very similar to this, but assume that that one becomes now coaxial. So what do we have in coaxial? You have an inner conductor, outer conductor. In the case of electrostatics, and let's assume that this is Z coming out, all right? And this direction is radial direction, and this one is phi. So in the case of electrostatics, we have charges here, all on the outer surface, if it's a perfect conductor, or distributed uniformly, if it's just another material, OK? It could be either one. Um, and then here, this also has a thickness. And we said that the outside will have to ground. Otherwise, this is not a good shield. And usually, the outer conductor is there to just provide that shielding to the inner conductor. Otherwise, the inner conductor will send a field everywhere. So what do we know here? The electric field goes like that radially. And what have we found? That is, of course, along the radial direction, A sub bar, N is the total Q, total here, all right, divided by um, 2 pi R, and then, of course, we have one epsilon naught here. Let me just put it. 2 pi epsilon naught, and then put 1 over r. So that tells you that as you leave the outer surface of the inner conductor and you move away from it until you reach the inner surface of the outer conductor, your field varies as 1 over r. So there is a change in geometry, I, in a change of the field as you move away, which you don't see in parallel planes, all right? And so let's now go to the same thing. But now we have a current that flows through the inner conductor and then returns to the outer conductor. So the current here, I, comes out of the board in the inner conductor and returns here. And what we see in this case is that the, mag the magnetic field goes along the A sub pi direction. So it goes like circles. It describes those circles here. And so on. And what we found also is that it does vary as 1 over r. H is A sub phi, and then I over 2 pi, 1 over R. When we go, why is this important? When we go to electromagnetic fields, the change, the, the, disc, the E and H will be very similar. E is going to go like that. H will always go like this. It's just that the E and H there will come out of the same source. Here, E is coming out of a Q, I comes out of a current, and this Q, the charge, and the current may not be the same thing. 
As a matter of fact, they're not. All right, one is moving towards the other is that. So all of this is building up now knowledge to go into more complex fields when the, the, the sources change with time and then when the two fields, ENH, are connected with each other. Any questions about this? Why are those structures important? Parallel plate capacitor, cylindrical capacitor, with resistance if the material has conductivity, the material here and the material there. What is this? It's equivalent to an inductor. So a parallel plate that looks like this, if it carries a current, is going to have an inductor. Very important to remember. We'll see that later in class when we go to transmission lines. A coaxial line, similar to what we are using for TV and other things. It also has an inductor. So these lines, later on when we are going to see them, they are going to have both a capacitance, an inductance, and a resistance. In addition, then we'll see later a conductance as well, which is the inverse of a resistance, all right? So we are building up now the um, circuit elements that we will use to be able to find an equivalent capacitance for this, an equivalent inductance for that, and then use them later when we um, try to take these complex, complex structures and reduce them to a very simple circuit um, analog. Yes? The direction of what? Um, it's from this, from the right hand, uh, right hand rule. The current comes out like that, so H should go like this. Okay, now let's go and solve some problems. Ah, that's outline. Can I erase it? Ah, class notes, let's see. Yes. In the parallel plate capacitor, one of the two things has to be given, either V or Q. Not both of them. But if you don't get any of them, then you cannot find. The, I mean, you have to know, or at least you assume yourself, because at the end you remember the capacitance and the inductance are functions of the geometry and of the electrical properties of the materials involved. So if I come and tell you, which in fact you will see it many times later on, all right? For now, I will give you Q or V if I want to ask you to find a capacitance. But later on, I can give you geometry, for example, I'm not going to give you in this class, but in another class you can take, you will take, if you take another class in this uh, series, you're going to see that somebody's going to come and tell you, find the capacitance for this structure without giving you V or Q in that case. You assume you connect it to a voltage source of one volt, and then you solve the problem from there. Because at the end, the one volt is not going to be important. All right, so C is going to be independent of your choice, obviously. It only depends on the geometry. I think I had the right one up, so we'll go down. Okay, we're going to find the inductance of a wire loop. Um, we have seen the field of a wire loop, but we are going to now try to find the inductance for it. Okay. And you remember that I have given you these formulas last time. All right? All of the concise formulas for the uh, problems that we are going to solve here. It's very problematic. That's the problem.
this does good. This one works better than Thank that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for saying that because I should not be there. And as a matter of fact, since I'm showing it to you here, I need to correct it. All right. So, tools, edit. Make sure. Okay. I need to remember that to have it. Okay, yes, absolutely needs to go away. I hope that I can see that. All right. Uh, because, as I said before, there should not be an I there. Thank you. Okay, now let's try to do the following two problems. The solenoid and then toroid. Any questions? What time is it? What time is it? Ah, three o'clock, okay. We have two simple problems to do, but we have time to do those on top hat. Okay, solenoid. Now we have more than one, more than one coils, and through them we have placed a magnetic core. So you assume that you have a magnetic core like this, that has a mu that is large, and then around it you wind a coil. I current goes in, I comes out, all right? And that direction is this. Now, if the current goes like that, what is the direction of the magnetic field? The direction of the magnetic field is going to go like that, inside. And it's going to be B. Now, you would argue that in this spe specific case, you should have gone to analyze this case from the single <coughs> coil and to build it up, all right? To build up the case starting with a single coil. However, we don't do that because there is something very unique in this case and then that unique uniqueness in the geometry takes us back to the parallel plate structure with the current flowing in one direction coming out of the board flowing back through the other metal all right so if i were in this case to go and cut this like here like this one if i were to make a cut like that that involves also a cross, a, a cross cut of this, but along its long direction, then what I will see if I were to do that is the following. I will see something very similar to what we saw in the parallel plate structure. Here we are going to have all of these currents 
Now I have few of them, but in reality you can have many. All right? Coming out like this, because they come out this way, and then going back from here. And we found in this particular case that indeed the magnetic field will go like this. And we found that H here will be N I divided by L. N I divided by L, okay? And from there, B will be nu and I divided by L, where mu will be the value of um, magnetic permeability in this medium, because you remember there is a core here, all right? There is a core, if you remember. And of course, what we assume also, which is and again, it's, it's approximate, makes the solution approximate, is that even if we have a finite number of coils, individual coils, so number n, and even if this has a finite, therefore, length, l and coils n, we assume that we don't have edge effects. Remember, like we did in the capacitor, all of these are good assumptions for circuit applications. May not necessarily be good assumptions if you have other applications, all right? But in this particular case, we assume that um, that's what happens. And now we are trying to find the inductance. And how much is the inductance here? The inductance is going to be total flux divided by the current I. Now, what is the total flux here? What kind of, w w the total flux, of course, to find it, we need to identify an appropriate surface. And on this surface, we have to integrate the magnetic flux density. So what surface are we going to identify for this? Yes. Well, so what, what would you like to do? Um, because it, uh, you may mix it up with inductance, isn't it? Mm. Okay, we can use W. And, um, or I can do the inductance like script. What would you prefer that I do? You want to change the, the, the symbol for the inductance? Can I do it like this? Okay. I said you can do that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, for me, somehow it's the difference is not, the difference is visible, but I understand when you see this for the first time, you, you may have some kind of a mix up. So I will use this for the inductance in this case. Remind me. Okay. Inductance. Some, book used, some books use that. Um, what is the surface then we are going to develop, we are going to consider for that one? <coughs> what is the surface? Yeah, the circular cross-section of the core, all right? Because that's where if we take the circular cross-section of the core and we see from here, we see it from there, what we see is that all of the magnetic field coming out like that. And this here will be 2A, OK? So two things. B is constant throughout the cross-section. So B here, uh, if we assume that this is the Z direction, Z, B then is going to be mu n i divided 
by L along the z direction. How about the surface ds? What is the vector of this surface? Yes, it's along the direction of the B field. So it's going to be AZ DS. So from these ones, we find the size of M will be nu and I divided by L. And that is the, uh, and then also the area of the cross section of the core, which is pi A squared. All right, and then the only thing that we do is to divide that by i. So it's nu n over l pi a squared. And that's the inductance of this solenoid. Yes? What direction? No, flux does not have a direction. It's a, it's a scalar. All right. Questions? Yes. DS. Okay. This is the surface S. Okay. We decided to use for the integration. A surface is a vector. You need to remember that. The same way like a line is a vector. And why is that? Because a surface, and like a line, have a direction. A volume is not a vector, all right? Only surfaces are vectors. So this, this S is a vector. And is S whatever vector, usually we call it N, if you remember, vector N. When you have a surface like that, which is on this side, all right, and your magnetic field lines come like this, the direction of this surface is like that. And the direction, the, the, the magnetic field lines in general do not have to come perpendicularly to the surface. You need to remember that. I select the surface like this to make it easier. So the magnetic field lines could come in another direction like this. They have to cut the surface, obviously. But the direction of the surface is always perpendicular to the plane, to the surface itself, all right? So it's going to be like that. And therefore, when I write this vector, n is this perpendicular, this un unit, unit vector that starts at the middle of the, the center of the surface and then goes outward, OK? That's the S. Any questions about this? All right, so the toroid, similar to this, but it's round. I mean, so the core by it, it's, it's, um, has a circular shape. And usually, the core is um, the diameter of the core is much smaller than the diameter of the loop the core creates. And you may want to tell me why, you may want to ask, why do we then take this kind of cores that look like loops and we do not take cores that are straight? Because then we save a lot of space, as you can imagine. All right, that's why we loop the cores. Okay, so now we have this core. Nu, high value in nu here. 
So it concentrates all of the field there, and of course increases the value of the flags. That's why we use cores. In, and if you increase the value of the flags, what do you do then? You increase the value of the inductance. Exactly. So, so here you come with, let me see, go out. And that will be uh, very tightly placed one next to the other. Goes like that. Okay. What do we know about the magnetic field? What do we know? Which direction is it going to go? The opposite, because it's coming like this, and inside, inside is going to go like that. OK, the magnetic field lines is not going to be only one, will be many, will go like that. And that's going to be your B. OK, we have found that B, so in this case, B is going to be along the negative phi direction, the way we have uh, introduced the direction of the current. And according to what we found, it's going to be nu n, which is the total number of the coils, n, number of coils, and divided that by the length of the um, core. And the length of the core is 2 pi b, where b, if you take the average here, this is 2b. And since this diameter is much smaller than this, practically, you are pretty good in whatever you take this. This value as the diameter of the core, or this value or that one, it doesn't matter. The difference between B and A will be very large. OK. Let's try then knowing B to find psi sub M. Same thing, I have to find the right surface S. And what is the surface? Again, the, the cross-section of the core, all right? And if this is the cross-section of the core, this is the direction of the surface, which in this particular case goes like this. And therefore, n will be minus a sub phi, OK? So as the magnetic field comes out like that from the surface, I integrate here on this. And what I find, since this is constant pra practically um, on the cross-section, I find that psi sub s is going to be nu and 2 pi b pi a squared. So it's very interesting here, the flux, this, the larger the value of A, or um, the larger the value of A, and the larger the value of nu, the larger the value of the flux. The larger the value of B, the smaller the value of the flux. So in design, you will have to select the two values to get the right to get to get in the right ballpark all right so obviously in designs we always to do, we always do that we try to select there are trends in geometrical parameters which are not aligning very well one is increasing the other is decreasing and when you do an optimization of this value you will have to find the right values for a and b to give you um, a flux yes 
I selected the current to go like this. The blue line is the magnetic field because it goes like that, and this is from the outside. When it comes inside, it's going to go in this direction from the right hand rule. Okay? Inside the core. Yes? So, uh, sort of the coils around the toroid, when they were contacting each other at the side, did that change the properties, the magnetic properties? Mm, no. Of whom? Of like what? Within the, uh, within the core itself, like when it was going around. They can, they can, if they, if you're going to put them so, usually they, I, I don't know exactly how they make them in practice, but you can uh, wind them very tightly. Okay. Because I was just wondering if like, uh, like they were touching each other at the side, what is kind of the control? Oh, no, they don't, because usually those wires, they are isolated. All right, the current cannot flow like this. Okay, From like, vert like if the wire is like this, it not flow like that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Why we define inductance to be the flux of the current over the current? Inductance shows the ability. You can derive it as a matter of fact. All right, it's not like. Um, you can start with a magnetic energy density inside the structure and then define the inductance as a measure of the magnetic energy that is stored in the device. And that gives you this formula. Yes. No, especially you will see when we go to transformers that you may have fewer coils on one side than you have the other. But usually it's not going to change those formulas. These are what we call, these formulas are approximate. You need to remember those. These, we use statics. These are statics, formulas that apply only for static fields. However, when we go to fields that have higher frequencies in there, so not it, 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 when you have a static field, what is the value of the frequency? Zero, okay? A static field has zero frequency in there. What does this mean? That the current steady, stays steady. It does not fluctuate, does not change over time. We don't have alternating on other currents, steady. When we go to fields where we have alternating currents, so we have a frequency, like a sine or a cosine kind of a of, uh, wave, then um, this one, these formulas are still good and they're called quasi-static formulas. And they apply very well for a number of cases. There are times, of course, as you go higher in frequency, where these formulas are, not, are very approximate and they don't apply. In that case, you would have to solve the problem in a computer to get the accurate inductance. And you would not use the formulas we are using. You would have to go and solve for the real values of B. You would have to um, put all of the geometries in there, and then probably it's going to give you a substantial variation in the value of L. But these are approximate formulas and good for statics, obviously, and approximate for uh, fields which are not static. OK? So in this case, we find L. In this, uh, I should have an I here. OK, and then L. It's not my, I have to tell you, I fixed my laptop to stay open for four hours. So probably that starts from this system, the fact that it goes out here. Um, it's not my laptop. But I wanted to tell you that here, L then becomes M. Mn of a squared over 2b. 
for this particular case. Yes. Yes. Old habits die hard. <laughs> it's very difficult to remember. Any questions? Okay, yeah. Any question? All right, now having done this, there is one more that I suggest is the coaxial, but uh, it's explicitly done here, so I suggest that you follow the same process and then you do, you do exactly uh, what I did to find the uh, static inductance value for a coaxial line. So now we can go and solve on these topics. Um, one, I, I was hoping that I can introduce the torque, but we're going to do it next time. So I have one tap hat problem, all right? And um, if we somehow have time, then I can come back to the coaxial. How about that? OK. One more thing, I asked um, over, was it weekend when I asked people to sign up, to, to select on Tab Hat <laughs> the makeup assignment? So I have left it open because it, I gave five points. I cannot give, I have to tell you, I cannot give an assignment here without giving any points. So I decided to give five, why not? Um, I have left it open for those of you who did not have time to go. Now, of course, it's <laughs> the decision has already been made. You can see that even randomly for people who went to, there was overwhelming request to move to next weekend. But um, the rest of you who have not um, signed up to do it, you have an opportunity to go and get five points. I will leave it up. All right, let's go to the inductance. Okay, here we go. And the problem says the following. All right. Uh, maybe if I present it to you, that is going to be bigger. No, but there's not. I think, I hope, hopefully, you can. So go back. Okay, I'll do that. It's better. Okay. It says here, in this structure, which is very similar to what we've done, there is a coil of wire. It's uh, wound, wound um, uniformly and densely around this thin toroidal magnetic core. The current of the coil is I, and the magnetic field intensity and flux density in the core at H and B respectively, okay? So if I is doubled, L, which is the inductance, doubles, L remains the same. Don't pay attention to, uh, okay, one, don't. <laughs> Why are you so anxious to do this? L, whoever did it, I, he has to, to go and do it again. Um, L remains the same, and L becomes half. All right? So then I will assign it. How did people go and do it? How did they do it without me not assigning it? Don't worry about it. 
<laughs> I need to find out. I have to ask them a question. Okay. And I will disconnect it, so. Okay, so I'm gonna unassign because everybody did it. Huh. Okay, um, unless it's part of this fluke <laughs> that uh, there is here, I there is one here. I don't know what this problem may be. That somebody responded already before I had assigned it. I need to call Top Hat and find out what the problem may be. Um, <laughs> somebody said it doubles. Somebody says it. Uh, so unless you did it just for fun, <laughs> which is going to be fine with me, if you did not do it for fun, then you have to worry. because we discussed that here on the board. Okay, so you guys look at, um, okay, at this point what I wanted to, um, I'll take the f last few minutes to um, tell you what I've learned, so you can read this one here. It's very similar, please make sure you read that material, all right, the coaxial line, the inductance. You may see something like that or similar to it in the exam. Okay, um, I read very carefully many of your comments, and there are some things I can do to address your comments, and there are some other things that you have to do to address your or your colleagues' needs. I have received a lot of comments that, says, that say that the groups are not working well, and that's not a good thing. Now, I understand that many of you um, have other things, and it's very difficult to get five people in the same place at the same time. But your generation, more than mine or anybody else's, is the one that can collaborate from long distances, isn't it? So um, this is, in fact, nowadays uh, becoming the, the uh, ability to collaborate when people are not in the same physical location now has become the norm. 
So I'm working for a team, and this is not just we are working in every proposal I have submitted and every project that I'm working on. There are people in the team who are physically away from my team by many, many miles. There is a person at Harvard, there is a person at Berkeley, there is a person at um, UC uh, San Diego, in addition to colleagues, and there is a person at Wisconsin. I'm giving you a uh, one specific example. We work together, and we are all very busy. We are all faculty, we all teach at different times. We have a, a time difference, and we find a way to do it. Otherwise, we will not be able to do the work we want to do. So working together, even in an asynchronous mode, is appropriate for a team, for a team to do teamwork. The fact that it's one thing to not be available physically, it's another thing to not be available. And if you are not available, that's not a good thing for your team. It's not. Especially those who are group leaders. If you are a group leader, usually the names are selected randomly by Canvas. If you cannot fulfill the responsibilities of a group leader, then you have to tell your team, and your team has to select another person. It's not acceptable for anyone to be a group leader and not be available. That's number one. Number two, a lot of you have complained that the, as you know, uh, when it comes to groups, there is only one solution from a group. And a lot of people have complained that some members of the team have done nothing to deserve that grade. So what I would like to suggest is um, that those who cannot participate, you tell me that you have not participated in the group meeting, in the group homework. And I will give you, of course, a non-participation a non grade. But, but this is the ethical thing to do. You cannot sail on somebody's boat, somebody else's boat. All right, you cannot ride somebody else's wave. I don't know how to say that. There are many examples, all right? You have to do the work. That does not mean that you have to solve the whole problem. You have to be available. It does not mean that you have to be physically available. You have to become available to your team. You know how bad I have to tell you, um, in, in when, when for those of you who will do all kinds of projects, um, in senior projects, you know how bad it is to have your team and some members of the team not to show up and expect the rest to do the work but share the, the grade, you know, there is not, nothing worse than this. I mean, ethica, it's, not, it's not ethical for our profession. And the ethical thing to do is to say, you know what, I have not been able to do that. I could not do it. Either you speak with me, so I will give you an opportunity to do it some other time. If you have a valuable reason for not being able to do it, I will accommodate your needs as long as you do the work. I cannot do the work for you, and your colleagues in the team cannot do the work for you. But I can accommodate you to do the work that you need to do. So I, the reason I'm making that uh, comment is because I have seen way too many comments like this in this class. So I have to tell you, uh, in, in classes like this, we do not only learn the um, material of the discipline, but we learn the cultural and social norms of the discipline, how we will work in teams successfully, all right? How you're gonna respect your colleagues' contributions. You cannot, uh, you cannot benefit from somebody else's contribution if you have not done your part. It's not good. So please think about it. I know you're under pressure, but don't allow pressure to, to, to force you to violate your principles. You should not do that. 
Because at the end, a grade is one thing. Your ethics will follow you, as you know. And eventually, you know, it's not just one time. Sometimes we say, okay, I did it now. I will never do this again. Well, it repeats. The first time you do it and things don't bother you, the next time it's going to be easier. The third time you're going to keep do it all the time. And then at the end, you're going to lose you're going to lose the sense of, of what you're doing. <laughs> and at some point, um, it's better to, to, to learn it now instead of learning that lesson later when in your job, when there are going to be repercussions, serious ones. So anyway, these are the comments I wanted to make. And we have 10 minutes. Do you want to do the coaxial? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was an answer. Good one. That's okay. I know it's very long. It's a, it, two hours are long for everybody, even for me. So um, sitting here. Any questions? Then you may have questions. Yes. Okay, do up, upload it again. Okay, that's the last lecture, isn't it? Could you send me a note, an, an, a note uh, email? Okay, so um, tomorrow, before you go, tomorrow we have a, uh, the problem solving session, and Wednesday we have the meter. Okay, listen to me now. One, one important information. We are gonna the the group, the group meter will be 50 minutes, five zero. So you have more time because people said that you did not have enough time last time. 50 minutes, we'll get a break, and the individual is gonna be 40 minutes. Okay, yes. Okay, okay, uh, could you please speak up? Yeah. Are they, yeah, everything open, I said. Everything is open, everything <laughs> in this class. For me, for of course, for everything is open, yeah. Everything, everything. everything. Can I ask you a question? Uh, I sent an email to you during the weekend about that magnetic field of wire. Ah, yeah, tell me a little bit yeah. because I could so not understand. Yeah, I 